Welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. Today's guest is Alan Lazarus. He's the host of Next Level University podcast and CEO of Next Level University. He's done 1,500 podcast episodes, and he ranks among top podcasters in self-development. But uh, Alan's expertise lies beyond the mic. He's a peak performance business coach. Um, he uses his background in engineering to um, kind of engineer, I guess, great human outcomes. And he has got a great audience across uh, 160 countries. And we're excited to have you on here, Alan, to address some of the important topics of the human condition on the show. Important topics of the human condition. I am ready to rock. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the intro. And it's been a hell of a journey. Nine years ago, I started a little company called Alan Lazarus LLC, and it was what you'll never learn in school, but desperately need to know. And I've learned so much since then, per- primarily how naive I was. So, <laughs> well, that, that's a that's a lesson for us all. Nothing like being an entrepreneur to uh, to get convinced that you make a lot of uh, mistakes. Well, this is actually really interesting to have you on because. Some of our audience comes from a world of business to business communications. Mm-hmm. And when we use these words, we sort of forget that there are people on the side of both companies. And uh, we want to uh, build as as much authentic relationships, kind of delight these people, right? Like they could be our customers, they could be our buyers, they could be our employees who are you know working with our customers uh, and future customers. And somehow, I think the language of business, the sometimes at work, just gets um, caught up in a, in a sort of almost dehumanizing mode. And part of it is we're playing safe. We're not taking necessarily the risks that we need to. And if we're not fully human, we're not taking the risk. We're not being our best self. You know, I think it sort of impacts the interactions that we have with our key audiences. So you're in the business of helping people unleash their inner inner best selves, right? And reach their potential. And a lot of it is at work in a demanding field. So, you know, one of the things that I struck me when I was listening um, uh, some of your other podcasts is the, the, the kind of the reference of the book that influenced you was just the regrets that people have at their deathbed and the top five regrets from uh, somebody who spent was a lot of time was the people who were on their deathbeds. So they had no one to lie to. And I wonder if you could adapt some of those to our professional life. Cause I think on a human life, we can, can probably could guess what some of those were, but if you could translate which ones of those resonate the most with people when it comes to their career and work. Okay. So the first and foremost, my, my prior life, you know, I mentioned nine years, but prior to nine years ago when I was 26, I actually worked in business to business. So I worked for an industrial automation company called Cognex. It does machine vision systems. And I sold manufacturing and automation equipment into manufacturing facilities all across New England. And so there's this fascinating thing that has always kind of irked me where we have our career and mm-hmm. professional development. And then over mm-hmm. here, we have personal development. Yeah. And for some reason, there is not a lot of crossover. Yeah. And I can't pretend to know the exact reason why, but I'll give you an example. We have we have two different listeners. So one of my listeners uh, is unbelievably into personal development. And this is what you'd call B2C, business to consumer. And I coach her. I've coached her for years. I've known her for five years. And and she's very, very, very all in on personal development, becoming a better leader, becoming a better yeah. person, becoming focused inward. And then there's this other listener who I got on the phone with probably about six months ago. She's in my group coaching program now. And I remember when I first met her, I went to my business partner, Kevin, mm-hmm. and I said, this is so interesting. She reached out to me on LinkedIn. She was a part of my alma mater, my college. And She's the most professionally developed person I've ever met. One of them, one of the most professionally developed people I've ever met. But her personal development set point is really low. She doesn't know about high performance habits by Bernard Burchard. She doesn't know about the four tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. She doesn't know about the compound effect by Darren Hardy. She doesn't know about some of these fundamental books, the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey. But yet 
she does know a ton of skills and a ton of IT and a ton of computer engineering. And she is an engineer and she's very well polished. She's very professional. And so what I've found with my clients, and I'm coming up on my 4,900th coaching session at this point, and all of them Mm. are an hour plus. Mm. Uh, I actually did some coaching earlier. And so I'm not a talking head who's just saying stuff. I want to make that very clear. I I coach 17 different clients right now. I've had hundreds of clients across my coaching career for the last seven years and all different countries, all different cultures, all different backgrounds. And we met tons of listeners from all over the world, all this stuff. So I'm not just saying this stuff. What I've found super fascinating is that everyone I've ever met is either more into professional development or more into personal development. And what I've found really fascinating is the people who are into professional development tend to be very successful in their careers and quite frankly, wealthy. And the people into personal development are not necessarily very well off career-wise. And I never fully understood it. The people who are into personal development tend to be good at relationships. Mm. Their their marriages are usually pretty good. Their friendships are usually very good. They, They usually don't have a strange relationship with their friends and family. But the people that are, I have one mentor in particular, unbelievably professionally well-developed, multimillionaire, super successful, amazing career, but takes better care of his Porsche than his own marriage. And I just realized there is just not this integration of personal and professional development. And I think it's very similar in a sense to the B2B versus B2C thing. And then B2G, business to government, is even more put on a mask type of thing in some ways. And so I think that there's got to be a way for us to try to find authenticity in all this. That's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I find that I actually tend to triangulate the feedback that I get from my co-founder in in my business uh, was the feedback that I get from my wife. And um, it's very powerful, very powerful. Very good idea when you can start seeing patterns because they are very, both very close long-term relationships. They both have ups and downs uh, naturally. And when you can say, Hey, this is really interesting under pressure in this environment, I'm acting in this way and I'm acting in a similar way in, in, in another environment. And it is, it's incredible uh, test. And I think, um, I, I kind of I'm sad that this is not a, not a connected tissue like you're describing, because to me, actually, if you create an amazing work environment where you really inspire people and you learn, I mean, maybe you learn how to nurture people. Maybe you learn how to, um, uh, you know, kind of help people achieve their full professional potential. You could go bring that home. Right. And you could inspire your kids and your, you know, your surrounding environment and vice versa. I think uh, being a parent forces you to grow up in a way that being maybe even an entrepreneur doesn't, uh, because Mm -hmm. I think you feel more in control over a startup, as crazy as that may be, or a high growth company, than you would over, you know, one year old, two year old, uh, or 13 year old was raging hormones. And um, it it surprises to me that you're finding this, but but I could see that people just, the people when they need help, they don't, they don't tend to align the two quite uh, as, as it would be, I think, most impactful. The You bring up several awesome points there. The, the through line that I took from everything you just shared, leadership is a universal craft and principle that can be applied whether you're a parent or a team leader or a CEO. But what I found fascinating is that we have this idea of you know work-life balance, which the 21st century has obviously really changed a lot because I think worth work life balance for me, I I'm just going to speak very frankly. I think that if you believe work and life are separate, I think you're in trouble Yeah, because they're not and they're, and they're becoming increasingly not, uh, you know, I work fully remotely. We don't have a headquarters. We have a 21 person team and we're not ever, no one's punching a time card. No one is, no one is going to a, a building and so I have to lead in this really dynamic, EQ heavy, technological era of the 21st century, where there is no separation really mm. of my work and my life. My my intimate partner Emilia, my girlfriend, love of my life, future wife, 
she's my business partner on another business we have called The We. It's We have a podcast called The Conscious Couples Podcast that's built underneath that. And if you want to talk about no separation between work and life, no, no. you know, and this is a fascinating little side tangent, but I thought this was kind of intriguing. I told Emilia, I sat down with her. I said, okay, so what are the percent chances of, of uh, an American couple? You know, the divorce rates are very high in America. <coughs> succeeding long-term and the chances are very small. And then what are the chances of a business succeeding long-term? And then what are the chances when you combine those? <laughs> right? So I said, we've, we've taken two of the most challenging Dangerous. things. Yeah. And we also plan on being parents as well. So basically take all of the biggest challenges and do them all together. <laughs> you know. Well, look, there, um, there are a lot of amazing stories on that. Actually, I want to, this, this brings me to one of your quotes um, that, that really intrigued me. Um, you said, I do not wish you to have an easy life, but I wish you to have a deeply meaningful, meaningful one. And I love that. And I think that kind of relates to the sort of balance that you brought up, like, you know, life's the, the kind of the notion of some sort of life work balance. It also, I think there's this notion of search for happiness, which is sort of the, the genre of, uh, of, you know, majority of the self-help literature and work. And I think some of the most thoughtful people that do communicate on that topic, they're not talking about happiness in the sense of like, I'm, you know, enjoying everything leisurely, loving it, you know, having my Thanksgiving celebration in Hawaii, which you and I clearly aren't because we're kind of, we're having a chat right now on Thanksgiving, but we are pursuing things that are maybe hard, maybe challenging, but they're deeply meaningful. They're deeply fulfilling. And uh, and I think bringing up a family, building a business, you know, tackling a challenging project at work that may have an impact for your organization success and so on. So let's let's dig into this, right? Because it feels like conventional wisdom that we're being served up um, actually discourages people from taking the the road less traveled, the, the road more challenging, and looking for this kind of ethereal you know, slightly narcissistic notion of happiness that has been propagated through media culture. I really appreciate this conversation and this question because this is my, one of my favorite things. I will say one of my favorite things to talk about. And it's this, this idea that, that you're going to get up and you're going to, you know, tackle your to-do list and the day is going to go well. And it's, I, I, I call it Candyland. There's this Candyland notion mm -hmm. of that's portrayed on social media of, uh, I'll give you this this tangible example. I have my executive admin. Her name's Jerry Ann. She's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Best executive admin I've ever had. And just incredible. She took a family photo. Her, her son, who I also coach, is uh, graduated high school. Beautiful photo. Husband, wife, four children. Just wonderful achievement. Love the photo. And I said, Jerry Ann, isn't it fascinating how that photo is picture perfect, but everything that was necessary in order to create that was nothing short of an absolute struggle? I mean, she has four little boys and a wow. husband. So she has five boys that she lives with. Five and little I, boys. And then on top of that, she also kind of <laughs> takes care of me in some ways as my executive admin, right? So it, yeah, five little boys. She actually says that sometimes. But anyways, it's... It's this interesting thing on it, particularly these days where there's these shiny objects that are shown of what happiness yeah. is and lifestyle and travel. Yeah. And and I just, just, here's what I'm, I, I'm saying. Don't fall for it. Yeah. Everything that is marketed is marketed to look better than it really is. And everything worth having of meaning is it comes through struggle. And I just think it's against human nature to believe anything other than that. And I grew up, my father passed away when I was two years old. I had a stepdad from three to 14. He left at 14. In some ways, I had lost three families. That's a longer story than we have time for. In some ways, I lost three families by the time I was 14 years old. And I had a really tough upbringing. Some good things, but really on the high end of tough. And I've gotten confirmation from my therapist that that is on the 10 out of 10 scale mm. of tough. But anyways... I don't, I never wanted an easy life. Yeah. I never wanted an easy life because you can't get in shape from easy workouts. And what's going to matter in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, 
but I also think it's rooted in a lot of science. Struggle creates growth, growth creates meaning and contribution. And if you live a life where you're looking for easy, you're just in trouble because life isn't easy and it's never going to be. And I think there's so much virtue despite that. There's so much to be had once you say, you know what, listen, life isn't supposed to be easy. It's hard. But despite that inevitable truth that we all really know if we sit with it, no matter what country you're from, no matter what background, like life is hard. I just think we kind of know that in our soul. On the soul level, life is hard. But but despite that, you can make something of yourself, you can make something of your life, and, and you can have a deeply meaningful life of growth and contribution on the other side of that versus someone who thinks life's supposed to be easy and then you think something's wrong with your life all the time and you right. have the victim mentality because right. when when something goes up against that belief system, inevitably yep. bad things happen, you're just always going to feel like something's off or something's wrong when in reality, yep. nothing's wrong. This is just the human condition. Yeah. Well, I, I think the part that you're, the kind of whatever the, you call it, struggle, some people, people call it flow, when you're engaged in activity that's a worthwhile activity, this is where, where you, you really prosper. You lose a little bit of your sense of pleasing yourself and you're doing something. So we, we're we empowering people to create in that B2B world that relate to. And it's fascinating to see people who didn't think of themselves as particularly creative all of a sudden are kind of discovering and, and playing and, and kind of doing the best in, in our case, communications work of their life to connect with another person. And they're coming back and they're saying, I've, I've created something really meaningful. I've, I'm not a designer, I'm not a developer, but I actually build, build something like a mini app to engage with people that matter to, typically it's an organizational uh, level, but sometimes for individuals. And so it's, but it's not easy, right? You need to be motivated to to create, right? And and even if we make the software easy, the act of creation, uh, the decisions to make, that's sort of that that's forcing something. It's much easier to consume, right? It's much easier to just be like absorbing, be passive, right? And I, but it's not working. Like we're all overloaded with consumption. Our audience doesn't want to engage if they if if we don't really make them part of the journey. So tell us a little bit about what are you seeing kind of how do you engage your um your audience both kind of digitally and in in real life sort of, kind of transformational journeys right like how do you I, make it a, a code co journey versus like oh here's a monologue of you know how smart i am and uh you know everything that i've learned which i'm sure you could do that right but i think you're clearly you know much more inclined to interact and co-create with people. I really appreciate that. I, I I can tell that you've done your research. I can tell that you've looked into some of the work and I, I that means so much to me. So thank you for that. When it comes to the analogy I use, so our 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 whole brand is next level. So next level university, we we have nextleveluniverse.com. The analogy that I like to use is not everyone wants to climb Mount Everest. But some people do want to get to base camp one or base camp two mm. or base camp three. Mm. And everyone who climbs Mount Everest needs a guide. So mm. if you Google it, 6,228, since the last time I Googled it, 6,228 people have climbed Mount Everest successfully and come back alive. Mm. And so if you're trying to climb Mount Everest, and this is a metaphor, meaning you want to change the world or whatever, mm. really most content isn't created for you. Because if I write a book on how to climb Mount Everest, I really can only sell it to I don't know, maybe 6,000 people. And it's not a big market. But what is a big market is everyone wanting a bigger, better, brighter future. Mm. And to me, whether you study Freud about the past or Carl Jung about the present or, or Adlerian psychology about the future, to me, the future is the part that doesn't get enough focus. That's my truth. I, some people are so focused on enjoying the moment that they yeah. aren't willing to go through the struggle. Climbing Mount Everest, you don't climb Mount Everest for fun. Mm. you climb Mount Everest for meaning. And because when you come back, you're different and, and you're, you're someone worthwhile, someone who has self-esteem, yeah. someone who keeps promises to themselves, someone who, who has substance and, and, and more importantly, and most importantly, someone who can now guide others to climb their own mountains. 
And so I'm only 35. I look 15. So if you're on video, you're like, how is he 35? But I'm 35 now. And and as I get older and older and older, my birthday was last week. I, I start to realize that the purpose of the climb is growth. And then the lessons that you learn on the climb, particularly when you're helping people grow along the way, it just it exponentially increases how much you can help people. And I'm never going to, I say this to my team often, I'm never ever going to do anything or, or, or share anything that I'm not currently doing. So I do habit tracking. We have an app that does habit tracking. Me and my team all do habit tracking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think your background might've just shifted, but we'll keep, keep. I've shifted through. it because I, I think we're getting uh we're getting into the evening time here. So, I've, I've, <laughs> I've shifted. Oh, but, okay. so, so, so you're, so you're habit. So on the habit tracking, go, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Yeah. So, so as someone who the, the, the through line of that was I will never, and I told this to my team, I tell this to our listeners, I'm never going to tell you to do something that I haven't already done or am currently doing. Mm. I'll never leading by example is everything. It's just everything to me. The the people in the industry that don't lead by example is it's just been heartbreaking because I had so many heroes. I was naive. I came into the health self help space and I thought all these authors were amazing. And I've just I mean pedestal after pedestal after pedestal have just been destroyed because I've met many of them and behind the scenes they're not who they say they are. And it is what it is. I think everyone you know part of that is me putting them on a pedestal. The other part of that is people are human. The other part of that is some people are quite frankly full of it, absolute mm-hmm. scam artists, and that is just a fact. Now, th- to answer your original question about how I engage my audience, number one, leading by example. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example. So we started a fit challenge. I'm on my 633rd day of exercise, and I post every single day, hashtag NLU fit pick. And so we don't just talk about health, wealth, and love on the podcast. We have a challenge that you can join and you can share your daily posts in the gym for accountability. Right. And and so what we're optimizing for is engagement. What we're optimizing for is, hey, reach out. Hey, email me. Hey, you know, let's get on the phone. I've met more of my listeners. I mean, I've met hundreds of my listeners on Zoom, one on one. I mean, most of the most of my team members are listeners that I met years ago. So they're they're bought in. So on that note, Alan, as we're wrapping up. How can people meet you? <laughs> That's the uh, so, way to connect. So to that point, that was a perfect segue. The uh, and That wasn't uh, planned, by the way. So alan at nextleveluniverse.com. If you want to know anything about me, nextleveluniverse.com is the place to go. We have a podcast called Next Level University. And then if you want to reach out, just say uh, email alan at nextleveluniverse.com, A-L-A-N at nextleveluniverse.com. And it's spelt just like it sounds. Just make sure that when you email me, you say, hey, I saw you or heard you on this show. That way I know it's not spam. And I, I know that it's because I get a lot of emails. I'm sure everyone does. And, you know, some people randomly trying to say, hey, you know, can we do your video clips or can we do your audios or whatever? So just just make sure you provide context when you email me and I'm, I'm going to email you back. I can guarantee you that. Amazing. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. You are so very welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the conversation so much, in fact, that I am now late. <laughs> yeah.